thank you all for being here. Uh, again, a real exciting time that we're going to have today talking about the big game draw and preference points. My name is Tish Palmadesi. I am a marketing specialist with CDFW, but I'm also part of a team that works to recruit, retain, and reactivate Californians um, into hunting, fishing, foraging, and shooting sports. Recruit, retain, reactivate. R3 is what we call it, the R3 team. So these harvest tunnel hours that we put on are a virtual program that we use to connect with you, people all over the state and offer resources to really build your confidence and get you more comfortable with hunting, fishing, foraging and the shooting sports. And, you know, really just getting outdoors and appreciating our state's natural resources, wildlife, habitats. The whole purpose is really to engage with you and give you some resources to start you on your journey. So today we have a very informative and knowledgeable panelist that will talk about the basics of the California big game draw understanding the different classifications of tags and developing a strategy for how to be successful for your applications. Something to note, all of our R3H3 sessions are recorded. So if you hear something that you like and you wanna share this knowledge with someone else in your circle, this episode will be available on the department's R3 page within a few days. So check in next week. Before we get started, some real quick housekeeping. If you're new to the Zoom webinar platform, which Seems unlikely, but we just got to cover these just in case. Um, you can change the way your screen looks by clicking on the top right icons. There are two views, gallery and presenter. Feel free to play around with it. What you select won't affect anyone else's screen. Today, we're going to be showing some spreadsheets for a portion of the presentation. So if you're tuning in from an um, iPhone or you have a touch screen on your iPad or even a touch screen on your laptops, you can use your two fingers and really zoom in on the information if you need to, or you can use the slider that divides the screen and maybe the chat box. You can move that to really zoom in on things as well. And again, it won't affect anyone else's screen. This is just you. So you do you, you see how you need to see. And again, if you miss something, we'll have this recording up next week. At the end of our session today, though, there will be an opportunity for audience participation. So you will really have, you know, control over how this conversation goes. And how we're going to let you participate is through the Q&A section. It's located at the bottom of your screen. It's an icon that looks like two little text bubbles. So click on that open up the dialogue box, and then you can type your questions and hit enter. And then our moderators on the back end will get through as many questions as we can. Because we know that there may be a lot of questions surrounding the big game drawn preference points, et cetera, we're going to devote more time to question and answers today than normal. Usually we save about 15 minutes. We're going to do about 20 minutes today. So again, you will have an opportunity to really drive the direction of this seminar. As I mentioned, all sessions are recorded and will be available on the department's R3 webpage. The website for that is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3, and we're going to put that in the chat for you so it's easy to find. You can find all of our past R3H3 recordings there under the California Wild Kitchen tab. Now let's introduce our team. On Q&A, answering your questions and fielding them to our presenters, we have CDFW R3 coordinator, Jen Benedict, and marketing, marketing specialist, Robert Karam from the R3 team out of the Office of Communication, Education, and Outreach. Also joining us today is Tony Straw, a system specialist with CDFW that is very knowledgeable when it comes to how the draw works, and Randy Shoup, our IT wizard that helps us navigate this Zoom webinar platform. So big thank you to all of them for helping us today. Now, we do our best to answer everyone during the event, but if for some reason your question doesn't get answered, or if it's kind of outside the scope of today's presentation, just email us your question. We'll put our email in the chat as well, and you can email us and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Now for our very exciting presenter, the infamous J.R. Young. He is the vice chair of the North American Board of Directors of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, he is a bona fide numbers geek, and I am not kidding. This guy loves Excel spreadsheets, and he loves making them. He applies for draws all over the country and studies the odds. Today, we are lucky enough to have him giving us a better perspective on how the big game draw works and sharing some of his tips, tricks, and secrets about how to get lucky with the draw. So with that, JR, thank you for being here, and you can take it away. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, like I said, I, I am a numbers geek, totally. Um, so I started diving into this a few years ago, you know, just a little bit of a little bit of a, um, you know, a background about me. 
is that, hang on, let me move my slide. Uh, I'm a Western States draw geek. I like to I like to do it. I'm a recovering accountant. I did I was in accounting for 11 years, and um, now I, I run my own business separately. Um, I like to take naps in the woods, um, especially on hunting trips midday. Um, it's the best way to you know cuddle up next to a, a, a rock. And also, as many people have already seen, I'm, I'm a Crocs enthusiast. Um, but uh, yeah, it's comical. We have this a couple of pictures of the caribou hunt um, out here. But if you're hunting in Alaska where it's wet. Um, and the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, NRS, neoprene socks, and Crocs were the way to go. I didn't trust the guy that I was going with when he gave me this piece of advice, but it was awesome. So, um, but how did I get here? Um, I started applying for draws uh, roughly 13 years ago. That puts me behind the curve in a lot of places. Um, I've been hunting all my life, but, you know, getting into the draws and expanding out to other states, um, I was, you know, in many states, I'm behind the curve. Colorado, um, you know, in a number of these states. And what that curve, what, what you call that is, is that there's pools of people that have been in for a long, long time. So I had to come up with a strategy of how to, how to think about this a little bit differently and figure out how I could, how I could draw in certain states. And I still don't know all the states inside and out, but I can start to plan where I want to be maybe a couple of years down the road, if you, especially if you get really serious about hunting like I do, um, and it's an activity that happens every fall, um, you know, coming up with some ideas of how you can best explore different areas to hunt. And that's honestly one of the most fun parts about it is, is where do I want to go? Where, like what speed, maybe it's what species do I want to hunt or where do I want to go? Um, there's, there's so many options in the West and all the access that we have to public land and in so many different spaces. That's one of the things that I just love most about hunting is where you can go with it. Um, uh, you know, the terrain, the people that you meet along the way, the little watering holes in small towns. And that's very true, whether it, you know, if you go out all over the West or just stay within California, there's, um, you know, there's so many great places in California. We're such a big state um, that, you know, I haven't even touched them all. I've hunted D zone, I've hunted B, never still have a drawing zone tag, um, but, but I've bear hunted in some of the X zones. So been around. Um, and so I started, started really kind of diving into this um, to figure it out. So is most of you, um, and one more thing before I get started, sorry, I meant to start with this actually, uh, really excited to be part of this panel in the R3 program. Um, I was an early volunteer in the R3 program when the state reached out and tried to find a bunch of volunteers to build this um, this program and having opportunities like this to learn is I think is an incredible opportunity. I didn't have it elsewhere. And so I was really glad to be a part of this and, and, and help shape this. And between the, the R3 Harvest Huddle Hours and the Advanced Hunter Education seminars that Sean does, are they're, they're just awesome. They're incredible resources. They're out there, they're available for you um, that you can go and, and watch these um, in the past. So with that said, I'll get started a little bit about um, what the draw is. What, what is the draw? So if you're totally new to hunting in California, and like I, I got my hunter education this year, uh, maybe you got it because of the pandemic and, and it was online only, and it got a lot, I would say it got a lot easier. Um, my son who's 10 got it this year. So he's excited um, to get out and do some small game hunting until he can big game hunt in a couple of years. But you've, you've got, done through hunter ed, you, you know that this, this application season is open. It opens every year from April 15th till June 2nd, and you can apply for big game tags. Now, there's lots of over-the-counter tags that you can just go and pick up a deer tag at almost any time. Um, by and large, that's, that's A zone. Um, B zone to an extent, sometimes it gets close to selling out. D three to five, sometimes it typically sells out every year, but all the way right up until the hunting season start. The hunting season starts generally the general season late in the year. So, um, but the draw is for those tags that um, are, uh, that are at a premium, right? So it's a methodology of providing big game tags when the number of tags is far exceeded by the number of hunters. There's a hundred tags, there's a thousand hunters, right? Not everybody's gonna get it. So that creates a system of a premium tag. A premium tag is effectively, it sells out when the application period closes because there's enough applicants within the pool. So these tags are at a premium. Preference points, and creating the system um, of a slight reward give preference to those that have continually entered the draw 
year in and year out. You enter the draw, you apply for a premium tag or you apply for point only, I'll get into this in a minute, and you don't get, and you don't get drawn, therefore you, you gain a point. Um, so each year you gain a point the, um, that, you're, that you're in the draw that you don't get drawn if, and I'll, I'll get to this in a second, um, uh, you know, if, you're, if you're unsuccessful. Within the draw between deer, um, there's a, there's, so there's two draws. There's, um, and then once the tags are determined each year, you have, um, there's a tag quota set and part of those tags for a, a given hunt, um, what we'll say is X zones for deer are given to um, the preference round. And part of, and then the a remaining portion of the tags are given towards the random draw or it's also called draw by choice. If you read, if you actually read the code, um, which I'm a nerd, I do. So, um, but it's, it's split apart uh, between the two groups. So draw by choice is truly random. Everybody that's left over, all the names are shuffled. It's like a big raffle bin. Um, it's a big digital raffle bin. They reach in, they pull out a couple of uh, the amount of names that are in there. And um, some of those people get tags by the draw by choice. So you always have a chance. Um, and that's really important to understand. There's always a chance to draw. And for many of our tags, um, deer uh, to an extent, but really for elk, pronghorn and bighorn sheep, um, I don't recommend the point only code. Um, always put your name in the hat because you never know what can happen. And I had a question the other day. I was like, well, I, by somebody said, hey, I'm just getting started with hunting. Um, you know, should I really go for point only if I'm talking about elk or pronghorn or bighorn sheep? Because I don't know what I'm doing. I, there's part of me that says, great, get some experience and yeah, go for that. But our odds are so long um, in many of those draws because we have such a wide range of participation, but we have limited, limited access to those species. I always say, throw your name into the hat. At the end of the day, you're not out anything if you get drawn. And if you do, it's a chance of a lifetime. And so much of what I love about hunting is just the adventure um, that comes along the way. Uh, you never know where you're going to end up, who you're going to meet, um, what you're going to learn, what you're going to find, and just having that opportunity to, to take, you know, maybe it's, you know, five days, maybe it's a week, maybe you take two weeks to go out on this, this hunt because you can. And uh, I mean, you'll have stories of a lifetime, regardless of whether or not you're successful. I mean, ideally, that would be, that would be better if you, if you were, clearly, but um, just the adventure. So to me, it's always have your name in the hat. So back to the, the, the split and those points. So for those draws that are preference. So when you talk about the deer draw, the, um, the deer draw is split 90% uh, go to people with preference. So those are the people with the most amount of points in a given draw. And deer is because of there are enough deer tags that um, there's, there's various thresholds of the point system. And I'll get into that um, when I get into some key documents here in a minute. The um, elk, pronghorn, and bighorn sheep are split 75% um, to preference, 25% to the random or draw by choice. However, um, that's true. Those statistics are true if there's four tags. If there's less than four tags, then there's a, um, you know, the image here kind of explains that. So the, the good ale bull hunt 373 down here has only one tag. So there's no, because it only has one, there's no preference point tag. It's just truly a random tag. So everybody in that pool, regardless of how many points they have, they essentially all have an equal chance at that tag. Um, if there's two tags, sorry about that. If there's two tags, it's split evenly, 50-50. If there's three, two go to the preference pool, one goes to the random quota. And then once you get to four, there's your 75-25 split. There'll be three in the preference point, uh, quota and one in the random. So um, understanding that is, is, is helpful because many of our draws, especially our elk draws, um, are, you know, one or just one or two, sometimes three tags. So they really almost are an even split amongst random tag holders and, and those with, with preference points. So in the current year, our, these are the list of our, our premium deer tags uh, this year. And typically they're consistent every year. Um, our exone tags are premium. Our general method hunts, the G tags, um, are mostly all our premium, the muzzle loader hunts, many of the archery hunts, and then um, the apprentice hunts. Now, some of the general zone hunts can bounce back and forth. And so each year, when you get the big game, game digest, um, right up front, usually by page three, they say, what's new this year? 
and it will list that um, I'll, I'll call out D6 in particular because D6 tends to bounce between being a premium, sometimes restricted and sometimes unrestricted. Last year um, for the 2020 draw, it was an unrestricted tag. Um, and as a result of that, um, a lot of people picked up that tag even as a second, um, as a, as a second deer tag. And because the demand was so high and it sold out by a certain date, that's how our tag classifications work really is how quickly did it sell out? It got bumped all the way from unrestricted all the way to premium because more people were hunting last year. Tag sales, I believe, were uh, license revenue was up like 9%, um, if I remember that uh, number correctly. But it's, um, so you have to kind of keep an eye on some of those. Uh, that's in the what's new category usually each year. Um, but you can also check it out, you know, page 12 of the big game hunting digest this year has these listed of tags and which of these ones are their premium, which of these need, would need to be, um, on your application if you want to, if you want to try for the draw. So what are points and how, and how do I get them? Um, now you'll see on the sheet, I underlined bold and italicized first choice. First choice is what really matters on your application. You, uh, in each application, you have three choices. You have first choice, second choice, third choice for your, for, for your first tag. Now, if you apply for a premium hunt as your first choice on your application and do not draw, you get a point. If you apply for the point only code PD in your first choice, and you automatically gain a point because you don't have an option for a tag in there. And you lose a point if you draw a premium tag that was listed as your first choice in your application. So really to gain or lose points, the key thing to remember, it always what's happened is in your first choice slot. So now this year, um, I'll go, I'll use D6 as an example. Um, and it may, may sound a little bit complicated, but because it D6 fluctuates. So because D6 is a premium tier, there won't be a lot of people applying for it first choice in the draw, because if it, they are drawn, it will take their points away. And some people are okay with that, but other people want to preserve their points. Maybe they're planning out for a different hunt um, a few years down the road. So what will happen, and this is a strategy that I recommend for people that want to hunt D6 because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good zone to hunt. They, we put D D6 as a second choice. Maybe you put a very hard to draw tag as your first choice. You put D6 as your second choice. If you don't draw the first, you gain your point and then you'll pick up D because there won't be enough applications in that pool. And like it's, I'm getting really nuanced here. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to my spreadsheet in a little bit that'll help, um, help people understand this. But like I said, I note here that look for tags that jump in and out of either restricted or unrestricted categories because sometimes they can jump to premium and people aren't paying attention and it may cost you points if you draw that tag if it was a premium and you didn't recognize it was and you may be losing your points when you when you had a game plan um, for for your point building system currently um, and then max points currently it's at 19 the draw started in 2002 so each year um, we, we still don't have enough there's still people in the draw that have never drawn because they're going for some of those long shot tags like the Goodell buck tag or the Anderson flat tag or the x5b tag um, they're waiting on those draws and you can see you know a lot of people are still have their um, still have their applications in on on those tags so the next thing with the draw is, um, you know, that's the kind of the point system, how it works in a nutshell. Uh, the next is, is party application. So what's a party application? It's basically when a group of hunters decide to get together and want to apply for a hunt. Um, they want to go on the same hunt together. They want all their names on the same ticket um, to be pulled out of that um, hat in the ether. Um, so for deer, up to six people can apply together. So you can get together with six people, put all your names together and, and go for the drawing. For elk and pronghorn, it's different. You're only allowed two. Um, so it's just uh, a two-person application. And gaps for, for bighorn sheep, the numbers are just, we only have 27 tags. Um, hopefully that number will be increasing in future years, but I, I don't know if that, if that section of the code will, will be changed. Um, if you do apply for a party, each party member um, that joins the party, they're it, all their points are average. So if one guy has, if you have a, just two people, one person has four, the other person has two, you guys average out to three. Um, so uh, understanding how, how that works. So 
it can be in your favor if you can find a friend that has lots of points, maybe 10, 11, 12, heck, maybe even all the way up to 18. Um, that's, that's to your advantage and it'll give you a lot of additional opportunities, particularly in the deer draw. Um, but if you're a high point holder and you know you really wanna hunt with your buddy, maybe they just started hunting uh, and they don't have any points, um, you're going to average out, you're going to average out to, um, um, you're going to average your points. So you're going to, you're going to lose points. I've done that before. Um, but it's often, it's more fun hunting with a friend, um, than not. And then, but with party applications, there's an additional, um, complication. I, I think it's, it's more prevalent in the, the big horn, um, sorry, not the big horn, but the, the pronghorn or sheep draw or pronghorn or elk draws stuttering over myself um, than it is in the deer um, you do have to understand how many if you're not in the if you're not in the preference round if you're not at a max point level and so I say that particularly for for pronghorn or um, for elk and there's more people in your party than there are random tags chances are you're not going to draw um, and the way that it works is that if you're in the preference round, meaning you're basically at, I'll call it max points for you and, and, uh, and somebody else, then if the, the party leaders, if the ticket gets pulled, the party leader will get the tag if there's only one available. Uh, and then the second person on the party will be the alternate. However, if you're in the random draw for, for that, uh, for that particular tag, if you're in the random draw, there has to be enough tags available at least two so because there's only two people on an application to actually successfully get the tag so as you you're working through this and maybe you've, you found new friends and you're and you're trying to group up on applications i don't necessarily recommend it for elk and pronghorn now sure enough i talked about this last year i did a very similar presentation to like this this last year just out on youtube and one of my buddies uh, I think him and his friend both had five points. They put it for the Marble Mountain elk tag, which I believe there's eight random tags, if I can recall that off the top of my head. Sure enough, they drew. So they totally blew my theory out of the water. But as long as you're aware of it and understand like some of those core statistics of and your odds and those chances, you'll be you'll be better set up for success as you kind of enter in and go through this draw this draw process. So what I look at each year, there's there's two key files. You can start with the Big Game Hunting Digest. All the information you need is in there. Um, they talk about last year's draw odds, um, what's available this year, how many tags are gonna be available this year. Um, like for example, this year, um, zone X3B, biologists came back, said, you know, deer numbers aren't as good as they have been in the past, we're gonna cut tags a little bit. So um, paying attention to things like that of seeing where tag numbers are going will ultimately affect the draw odds because the draw for deer particularly will be, will be split 90, 90% uh, for the preference draw and 10% for the random. So if those tags are cut, it shrinks that pool. So those number of people that are gonna get picked up in that preference draw, maybe somebody thought they were gonna be guaranteed or they had enough points based on previous year's history. Well, they're, they may lose out on that opportunity. So it's, it's really to the level that you wanna take this. I. I'm, I'm, I'm pegged, my meter's pegged when I start looking at this stuff. I look at it in a very detailed level. You don't have to be that, you don't have to look at it like the same way that I do, but just picking up on some of those nuances, you can, you can really kind of up your odds, maybe draw a tag a little bit earlier um, than, than you expected because you, you just kind of monitored some of these changes year over year. Um, but again, that's, you're, you're way off into the details at that point and you don't really need to go that far. The Big Game Digest will always tell you um, you know, what was the max points uh, for an application? Uh, what was the max, or, you know, what was, uh, what was the highest point awarded in the draw? And then what was the lowest total? So that will pick up the range of, if there was a hundred tags, where did those people spread amongst those point values? And you'll see this in, in when I go to my next, next screen here, cause I'm gonna jump over to the, the statistics document. So it gives you an idea of what it, what it, at a minimum, what it takes to draw a given tag. Now, sometimes this moves a little bit, right? Um, maybe there's more people in the pool. Um, there's something called point creep. Um, and that's where, again, you have more people in the pool than there are tags available. So maybe one year a tag um, took three points to draw. Three point was the minimum. Um, but then 
you know, there was enough people applying and reapplying that it took four a following year. That's what's called point creep. So it's basically the, the minimum point awarded increases, um, increases in a given year. So, but my two documents to look up, Big Game Hunting Digest, that's all you, you really need. Everything you need is right in there. Um, and it's really, really clean and easy to understand. The second document, and this is the one that, that I've built this presentation on, is really the, um, the big game drawing statistics. Now, both these links are here available to you. Uh, I believe if you signed up as an email, these will, these will come in to you as well. Um, you'll get links to these pages um, on the CDFW website. But what they do is get you um, into these files and they are the full detailed summary of the drawings. And they show how many applications come in at each point level along the way. They're awesome documents. Um, they're really kind of fun. Maybe not, not as fun for you, but fun for me to dig into and see where people are applying, how they're applying. And also when I look at this, I see some mistakes that some people are making. And that's back to that party application where maybe there's not enough tags available for a party, um, but people applied as a party. So they effectively eliminated themselves from the, from the draw. Um, this sheet, um, I believe on the website, it comes out as a PDF. So um, I've manipulated this. It's going to look a lot different than, um, than you might see it, but the columns and the rows are basically all the same. I've just shrunk stuff down, expanded it out, and, um, and just manipulated it a little bit. But here's how it goes. So it has the hunt code over on the right-hand side. This is the hunt tag description in column B. Tag quota, so how many tags are available in each of these deer draws? So this is the deer summary that we're looking at here. What is the preference point tag quota? And again, here's that 90-10 split. So for D17, there's 500 tags available. So 10% of those tags is the random quota right here at 50. And 90% um, of the tags is 450, right? So with our deer draw, that's why it's very different because there's literally hundreds of tags available in most of our draws. And, and then, so, and then, then it'll list out the total applicants, right? So how many, how many people applied for these tags in the prior year? So this is all based on 2020's numbers. Um, and then columns G all the way over through, um, columns G all the way through over is the point values awarded. So here's 18, here's seven, I call it 17 plus. That means it's more than 17, less than 18. Um, this is a party application, right? One, if there's somebody in this column, I'm going to make the assumption that one point, one person had 17, one person had 18. So, and in the way that I've color coded this, um, the green, um, the green here means that anybody in that area under these point values would be, a, were awarded the tag in the prior year. So C zone is a, is a premium hunt but there's 8,000, 8,100 tags. Uh, that's a lot of tags. Most people apply at the zero point level. There are some people that come in and they spend, um, they spend a few points on um, to get into the tag, but the vast majority of applications are um, down here at the zero point level. Um, you get into some of these other tags, you can see that the green starts fading back to the left. And that's because they take a higher point value to, uh, to be awarded to them. And so when you look at the Big Game Digest, it'll talk about that. It says, what is the minimum point value awarded? So under X2, it's gonna say eight and, and change. I, can't, I don't know what they, they rounded out to, but it'll be basically eight and change because right here, this was the level that some people picked this up on the preference draw. And then um, based on the way that the, na the names were randomly sorted, um, with a point value associated with them. And then everybody else was left in the random, was left in the random draw. So here's how, this is how you can really start to strategize. Um, particularly if you're looking for, I'll start with a lower value tag as it, it starts to make sense. So for example, X3B here. Um, and funny enough, I just happened to pick it, but I talked about X3B earlier, but there is less tags this year. Last year, there were 794. I think they dropped it to 650 this year. I'm not 100% sure. So all these people in green drew the tag and they you know, are back to square one. Well, now there's 
the people that are waiting in line um, are come in at this two, uh, two, um, one and change, one um, slightly greater than zero point values. This is where the people will come in and start to pick up the tag in the future year because everybody that draws gets reset back to zero unless they had their points um, reinstated last year, which I'm not going to get into that because it just throws a whole nother wrinkle and it'll hopefully wash itself out next year. And hopefully we don't have the same level of catastrophic fire this year. Um, and even if we, we certainly will hire, hopefully the forest service, um, doesn't, uh, propose the same level of restrictions that they did in the past, because it's, that was almost nothing like I've ever seen before. So, but here, it, and so here's how you can start to build this strategy. So if you're in and you hear about X zones, what is, what is an X zone? Why are they premium? Well, they're really premium because of the type of terrain that they are for hunting. Um, it's not Western slope of the Sierra Nevada. It's not the, you know, the coastal areas of like, of, you know, Mendocino National Forest where they're thick forested forests and uh, it's often hard to identify deer most of the X zones is a lot of open country, lots of sagebrush. Um, you have much higher visibility, and hunters tend to have a much higher level of success because they're not dealing with um, the you know the slopes of the Western Sierra that that we're that we're so um, familiar with. So, part of this is to try and figure out like where you want to go, or maybe uh, somebody's told you that. Um, you know, that you should try and try and draw X6B or maybe you live in the Lake Tahoe area. So like the, um, you know, X68, X7A, X7B, X8, all those areas are, are pretty close to the Tahoe area. And that's, a, that's an easier tag for you to hunt because you're closer to it. So starting to build these ideas of, of how you can get into the draw and what happens after you start building points, because then you can start to see if I have one point, where can I get into a draw? If I have two points, what can I start to get into the draw? If I have four points, where can I start to get into the draw? Where can I, where can I actually get tags? So it's really about creating this plan for you in future years. Now, if you're new to hunting and you just, you know, you can start out with some of our more general over-the-counter tags just to gain some experience, but then you can start to build these opportunities for you in the future. Maybe you meet up with somebody and again, they have 10 points. They want to, they're happy to average their points out. Where can you guys, where can you go? What are your opportunities um, for, for the future? And so that's, that's really kind of how I look at the spreadsheet. This is how you look at these minimum point values. Um, I've created some odds over here and I call, it's called the bubble odds and then the random odds. So bubble odds are at that point, uh, basically the first box um, on here to the, to the right of the green where some of these people will get picked up in the, the preference draw. The rest of them will be random into the random. So, um, so if you're in the prep, if, you're, if you had four points for X6B, if you had four, if you had four points last year, you had a 28% chance of getting drawn through the, through the preference round. If you didn't get picked up in the preference round when you were on the bubble, because that was the lowest point value awarded, you get back into, you're in the random odds. And there was a whole host of random people for these 30 tags and your odds were basically 2%. So you can start to see, like, if, you, if you know you have no chance of drawing in the preference, you can kind of see, start to see what your odds are for the random. And you can figure that math out pretty simply. Um, it's, it's just understanding how many, how many, what's the random tag quota and how many people are left in the draw after the preference round starts, because, you know, you're going to take a couple hundred people out of the draw, but how many people are left? And that's where you can figure out your, your random odds. So there's some, if there's a few people in here that are, that are very experienced in the draw and maybe they're close to, to max points, um, you know, I'll, I'll highlight one thing here. So the G3 Goodale buck hunt is, um, you know, it's a very well-known hunt, 4,700 people apply for it, 275 max point holders. So these are people that have literally been applying for 18 years for this tag, but there's only 23 tags available. There's only two available to the random quota. Now, this number that's four here, I'm going to make an assumption that this is one guy, one person with 17 points, one person with 18 points, and they're averaged out. So they're somewhere in the middle. And there's two groups in here. 
But effectively, since there's only two tags available, that means that whoever had max points actually had a chance to draw this tag. And the person who didn't had 17 um, was in the random. So the person who had max points actually pulled themselves out of much greater odds than, than they actually had a shot for. So I always tell people this every year, if you've been applying in California for year after year after year, and you think you're in the max point pool, and I don't know how many are on the call today. I know this isn't geared towards them, but I'm sure a people, few people are around here. And you want to go on a party application and your, your friend says that they have max points as well, make them show you, make them log into their account on the, on the automated licensing system and show that they actually have max points because I have a feeling there's some people in here that either don't understand how the draw works and that they're whoever um, putting these party apps almost effectively eliminate themselves or somebody's telling them that they have max points and they really don't. So um, famous words, trust but verify. So jumping over to the to the elk draw, I'll move I'll move faster because the deer the deer draw makes sense because there's so many more tags. There's lots of opportunity for for low point holders to get in and start to draw deer tags, and um, and you, you can see that when you start to look at this and you can start to see those minimum point values needed to draw those tags. Um, elk becomes a different a whole different beast. Um, no pun intended because elk are, elk are structured that they have, um, there's always a random draw and then everything else is almost max, it heavily weights towards the max tags. But the key point here is, and sorry, I'm just gonna highlight this one more quick time. Here's a person where there's one random quota and that there's two people in at a party app and they're splitting again. So again, I think that's, a, that's a, probably those same people that are split between max and one less than max. But the key strategy for elk is a calculation that I ran over here Right. What are the max points odds? So really, if you have max points, how many people were in that pool? How many tags are available? Simple math. For the random odds, it's just that. How many people, how many applicants are in the pool for how many random tags less the preference point tags? And you can see most of our elk draws are single digit, success, single digit percents for the random odds. And it's important to look at that because even though it doesn't it may not seem like much when you're looking at the statistics here, you know, you, you actually, you almost, you do have a little bit better chance in some of these areas, but you'll see that most of them are sub 1%, um, which makes it, you know, makes it pretty long odds, but they do start to creep up. So each year it's important to, if you want to actually have a chance at trying to draw an elk tag, look at these odds, figure out where you have the best chance. And then as you start to build your points, um, maybe at some point we, we get a lot more elk hunts and those numbers start to change, but that's really how elk and pronghorn truly work. There's a big max point pool. Everybody else is in the random and there are, however, just a few tags, particularly as you get into the, you'll see a few hundred points here, um, hundred percent odds in the max point pool for some of these elk tags. Typically they're antlerless tags. However, what that means though, is that of those random of those tags, um, so for example, the Marble Mountain antlerless elk hunt, nobody was in the max point pool. It was at 17. And of these 11 at the 17 points, eight people applied. So there's, so there's three left. Some of these tags start to work their, work their way back down in point numbers. So if you start to get into these, some of these double digit numbers, there are some antlerless hunts that really do start to come into reach. And so if you pay attention to those, you can, um, you can take advantage of that. And then real quick, because I want to try and get into the questions here and understand what you guys have. Um, pronghorn, very much the same way. They're very heavily weighted towards max point holders. Um, um, you know, so we had 185 ma max point tags for 751 max point applicants. So you can do the math on that. It's going to take a few years to literally work through all these people. Um, however, with uh, some of the pronghorn hunts, there is advantage if you are willing to take archery equipment um, you know, there is some additional opportunity for you because um, not as many take, people take those tags. For example, likely tables, archery buck. There was only, there's 12 preference point tags. There was only one person in the max point pool, three at, um, three at 17 and then nine. So it actually whittled all the way back down to, to 16 points for the, for the preference draw. So, and there aren't as many people in these archery tags. Granted, hunting pronghorn with archery equipment is incredibly difficult. 
Um, but it is an opportunity if you want to if you want to think about that. And again, back here to the random odds, just like the others. This is the number of people with the number of random tags available. None of these tip north um, more than one percent. And then finally, sheep. Sheep's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. We have twenty-seven sheep tags. If you're in the if you're in the preference draw, your best chance last year was was the White Mountain hunt, but applications increased by forty-six percent last year. Um, and then your best odds, true best odds last year for the random tag, it means if you have anything less than max points, was only 0.11%, but that was the Katy Mountain tag. Um, something of note though, the South Bristol, um, there was a 300% increase in, in people applying to the South Bristol hunt than Prast. So this number of the random draw odds um, uh, dropped quite a bit quite a bit last year. But also um, for sheep, you can see here, this number here is the number of people that changed from the last year to this year. So there were actually quite a few people that uh, ended up dropping out of the draw, or maybe they just didn't apply and they'll be back in, maybe they'll be back in this year. Maybe they'll be back in next year. Um, so we don't, we don't know how that'll, that'll look. So anyway, um, I'm running long here. So I wanna jump into some questions and make sure that I answer them because I have my ideas about the draw, but I want to know what you guys want to learn. So Tish, do you have questions for me? Oh gosh, we do JR. We've had a lot coming in. So um, I'm glad that you kind of factored in having a lot of time to do this. So jumping right in um, on your point slide, you mentioned how we gain or lose points. You mentioned that you lose a point if you draw a premium tag with your first choice, how many points do I lose if I'm drawn? Just one and keep the rest? No, you lose all your points. So however many points you've accumulated over the years, you'll be set back to zero and, you'll, and then you jump in all the way on this, this column at the bottom, uh, the far right of the spreadsheet again. Okay. Um, how do I choose which zones I want to apply for a deer tag? How do I know which zones are good or desirable zones besides just being close proximity to where I live? They vary from year to year. And the important thing is, is to scout. If you, especially I recommend to people, if you know it takes a couple of years to draw, it takes a couple of points, spend time there, go there. Don't, um, you know, things change year to year. We have a, a tremendous opportunity with bear hunting. Take up bear hunting if you haven't, get a bear tag. And go, and when the deer season's close, go and hunt some of those areas that you might be interested in. Now, all of the X zones you can't bear hunt in because of some of our bear restrictions. However, many of them you can, and there's tremendous opportunity. You can get in there after the season and you can really start to learn about an area. Um, that's one of the best things, squirrel hunt, small game hunt. There's just going camping and fishing in the summer and starting to learn an area really can help to pay off if you're, trying to save up, you know, one, three, five, six points for, for a special hunt, you know, spending that time and investing in it, I think is, I think is really important. Um, especially if it, the, the higher up the scale you go, the more important it is to be invested because then yeah. somebody can go in and like, I spent eight points on this unit and it was garbage, but you know, they never went there before. They never, they never scouted it and learned some of the, the tips and tricks. The people that spend most of the time out in the field are the ones that are consistently successful year in and year out. And they do that in our general units. They do that in B zone every year. There's, there's a few people that I know that go out to D3 to D5, which is our very general um, Sierra unit. And they're successful year in and year out because they know it, they spent the time there and they've, they've figured out, they figured out how to be successful every year. That's, that's a really good tip. Um, now you mentioned um, dropping out of the draw. What do you mean by dropping out of the draw? So some years, maybe people forget to put in an application or they, you know, or they, they chose not to. Um, so in California, I believe it's a five year um, time that, so you can apply for the draw and maybe you just decided to not put in, you don't, you're not interested, whatever. So you don't put in for the draw and maybe just get an over the counter tag or you choose not to hunt. California will allow you to keep your points for five years and then they're um, e effectively expired and you lose all of your points. Many other states, if you take, you can take up only one year off. So California is very, very generous um, with a five year gap um, to not sacrifice your points. Many points are other states are like I said, one year off. And then if you're not back in, you're gonna, you end up losing all your points. Wow. They really, okay. they really keep you committed. Yeah. Um, now we talked about that you 
you, you, you know, you apply for draws in other states. Do you do this breakdown and this analysis and these spreadsheets for every state that you hunt in? Um, somewhat, yeah, because every state's different. Every state produces different data um, to look at. But I, I do, I leverage, um, I look at, um, there's lots of statistic websites out there that do a lot of breakdown for you. Eastman's has probably been around the longest time. There's Go Hunt, um, uh, there's Base Map, Hunt and Fool. There's so many other publications out there that can help you kind of short chain the, that look. However, I just enjoy doing it myself and looking at, looking at where the, the point values are. I love draw season. I mean, this week was like Christmas for many people. So we Montana moose sheep and goat draw results came out this week. I'm not hunting any of those. Idaho moose sheep and goat results came out this week. I'm not hunting any of those either. <laughs> um, and then Utah, same deal. Uh, moose sheep, uh, moose sheep, goat, and I think one other draw came out this. Or their entire draw came out. Elk, um, all of it. And I didn't draw any of that either. So, but it's, you know, it's a sense of anticipation, um, you know, each year and, you know, and I, I know that across the West, I'm applying for odds that are very much like our elk tags. They're, they're a, a percent. And I've, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that has an incredible amount of optimism for 1% odds. <laughs> now, and as far as the, like when each state has their draw is California kind of later or before, would you say? Yeah. California is almost uh, is almost last for the okay. it, for the biggest portion of the draw. California is very late, so I I plan my whole season. I um you know I I applied for Wyoming elk this year. I applied for Montana elk. I drew a Montana elk tag, so I withdrew my application in Wyoming because I know I'm going hunting in in uh, in Montana for elk this fall. Um, but California is very late. So almost all the results are in. We'll get Nevada results next week. Almost everybody's in. Some states break up their draws. Like it's, you do an elk and an antelope application mm. early, and then you do a, a deer and bear application later. So there are some draws after us, um, but we're typically pretty late with the June 2nd deadline. Um, but I will also say we have the fastest turnaround time of any state, which is awesome. Uh, Montana's catching up pretty quick, um, but our turnaround time on our draw is is the fastest out there that I know of. Um, JR, can you tell people a little bit about, about the fundraising random draw tags? Yeah, so the fundraising tags, just as they as they sound, there's no points associated with them. There's um, it's literally you're you're buying a ticket. Is it seven bucks this year? Eight dollars and thirteen cents. 813, I think is the, That's close, yeah. and it's, it's $7 and change. You can buy, I think as many as you want. Um, and it's just like a raffle ticket. Um, if you've ever been to a fundraiser, there's like a raffle ticket. You throw, you throw your name in the hat um, as many times as you want um, and hopefully get uh, you know, the opportunity to draw one of those great fundraising tags. There's golden opportunity tag, which I believe allows you to hunt deer almost all the way until the end of the calendar year. Um, there's open zones tag, which means you can hunt any zone so long as it is open for regular hunting. Um, the golden opportunity gives you the, by far the largest window. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of share opportunities. Um, and the share hunts are private land um, hunts. And again, you, you apply for those. Those are a one, time, a one application per person. Um, so it's not like a raffle ticket where you can put your name in the hat a bunch of times, but you just apply pay a fee, I think it's 11 bucks, 11 a change, um, and get to hunt some of those private properties. Usually there's an orientation with the landowner. Um, they're really good, they're good opportunity hunts. I've drawn a few, I've not drawn a big game one, but I've drawn, um, oh, sorry, I did actually, I did draw a, a deer hunt many years ago. I've drawn, I drew a turkey hunt at the Bobcat Ranch. Um, so those, those opportunities do come up and, and they're out there. Awesome, thank you. Um, can you explain the concept of how someone might miss their best odds for being drawn again? You kind of mentioned it during the example of someone having 18 and 17 points and one being put in for random and the other getting the tag and this person was a little bit confused. So part of that is, um, I think what I'm getting there is, is that's the party application system, especially party applications um, under elk and pronghorn. And that's really driven by the fact that the random tag quota is often so small, especially for elk. Sometimes it's only one tag. So to put in for a party, if there's only one tag available, only the party leader is going to draw that tag if potentially. 
Um, but if you're in the random draw towards the, towards the lower point values, you won't actually draw. There, there has to be enough tags available. There has to be enough tags available for the full party. So if they pull your name out of the hat and there's not enough available, they will skip you and go to the, go to the next. This is also true in, in deer as well. So, however, deer is very different in that there's often, um, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, sometimes well over a hundred tags for a party application. So you can, you, you have a much better opportunity if you know that you're at the random point level um, and you're in that mm -hmm. random draw that you, that you look at the random tag quota and make sure, make sure there's, a, there, make sure that there is enough. Okay, thank Hopefully you for that clarifying sense, that. Yeah, thank you. It gets it gets really nuanced. It's different between deer and elk and pronghorn. Um, a lot of it's really dependent upon who has who has max points. But it's under, it's for deer. It's really important. Just understand your threshold. Do you believe you're going to be in the preference draw because you have enough points as a group, or do you believe you're going to be in the random? If it is the random, make sure that there's plenty of tags available. Um, if it's just you and a partner, awesome. If it's you and six people. You're a little more. You are a little more at risk, right? right. Because maybe there's only five tags left, and your name and that your ticket gets pulled. Well, they're going to pass you up because there's six of you, and there's only five tags left. So you actually you you have to shortcut yourself by that number of random tags based on your group size. So you have to again, that's getting into deep into the math, but just make sure that there's plenty of random tags available if you think you're going to be in the random portion of the draw. Okay, and you you kind of were just talking about max points. Um, if you need max points to be drawn for something, how does that work when the max points go up every year? Does that mean that someone who didn't start putting in back in say 2002 will never be drawn except by random? To get to max points, yes, you you needed you needed to start putting in in 2002. I'm not where anywhere near max points. I didn't. I moved to California in 2003 and started putting in for the draw in 2007. So I'm, I'm what we say behind max deer there. There's all sorts of opportunities to catch up on, but max increases every year. So it's really how it's really the, those people that did start at the very beginning are the truly the ones that will always be the max point holders. Um, deer, okay does erode quite a few people out of the pool each year because there's a lot of opportunity, but there still are these few tags. Um, and again, Goodale is one of those. There's still 275 folks in this pool waiting for those, um, you know, some of the muzzleloader tags too. There's 30 people. There's not as many as the muzzleloader side, um, but there's still 30, there's still 30 people um, still applying for that. So yeah, eventually, if you didn't start in 2002, you'll ultimately, and you're more than three or four points behind, you'll never catch up to max. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a few more that we'll try to kind of fire through real quick. Um, do I need a hunting license to apply for the draw or can I apply? And if I'm successful, then purchase a license? Uh, I believe you need the license to apply for the draw. Okay. Um, if I move out of state, will I lose my California preference points? Not if you continue to apply. Okay. And and um, uh, then there's that five year wait. In right. There. However, you then become a non resident, um, and your and the odds get a little bit even tougher as a non resident. Oh wow! Um, so I recommend purchasing a lifetime license um, for many people that that may move out of state, especially if you have a, a fair bit of points. Um, and you don't want to totally lose them um, and you want to keep going and you know that there's a tag maybe a couple years away, yeah. purchase, a, purchase a lifetime license. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I just uh, clicked off of my questions. Okay. Can I transfer preference points from one species to another or to another hunter? No. Okay. Nope. You could average them on a party application, but otherwise there's, I don't, there's, I don't believe there's any way to transfer tags. Okay. Um, do you know how many people have max points? Um, yes, we can. I mean, you can look into the statistics here. So for deer, um, 503 people have max points. Okay. For elk, 2,425. Oh, wow. For pronghorn, 715. For sheep, um, I didn't do that ad, but I can do it really quick. It's 
um, well in well into the thousands again. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. For sheep, there's sixteen hundred and eighty nine um, people with with max points, all wow. fighting over ni nineteen tags. So. <laughs> yeah. So how do you um, pick where you put in for? Like, especially if you live far away from the X zones, any tips to make those decisions even just beyond statistics? I mean, you start start with the statistics. Uh, the best thing to do that I can recommend is to is to is to go and spend time there, um, yeah. and find a place. Um, again, we have we have lots of opportunity to go hunting, um, long bear seasons, small game season, upland seasons. Um, start to spend time someplace. If you have your heart set on an idea of maybe maybe X four just calls to you for some reason. Um, go spend some time there, find it out, you know, look around, see, see what's there. Um, invest the time. If you're going to invest the time to build points, invest the time to have some idea of where to go, um, where to go once, once you're there. Right. Um, or wing it. And then once you draw that tag, then you got to go scout. Um, I drew a, this isn't California related, but I drew, I drew a moose tag in Idaho, um, several years ago. And I had hadn't been on the I didn't know anything I just put in for a moose tag it was a total hair and Larry draw but I spent some time that summer went up there um scouted around figured out where I was um you know what's the road access where can I go camping where, right. where are my best where are my best opportunities um either that or or just if you're if you want to kind of fly by night wing it and that's fun too like that, that can an be adventure yeah throw you know make it an adventure that's that's all part of i mean hunting is an adventure that's one of the greatest things about right. it it's what's over that next ridge what's around that next corner what if we walk up this draw just a little bit further you know there's there's always something to be learned or just something some some sort of curiosity that will drive humans and that's that's just what i love about hunting so even if you haven't decided on a spot um you know be winging it is totally acceptable Awesome. And uh, Tony wanted to throw in that they CDFW shows average success by hunt in the uh, digest as well. So that could be a good resource for that. Okay. One last question, JR, are points specific to each different species or are they the same applied to all species? They're, they're unique to species. So you have to apply for each species that you apply for, you get a deer point, you get a pronghorn point, you get an elk point, you get a bighorn sheep point. So they're all, and they're all individual. They're all tracked separately. Perfect. Well, we're going to include um, ways to, you know, contact CDFW and possibly contact JR in our resource email that we're going to send out later this afternoon, but it is one o'clock. Our time together is up. If you didn't get your question answered, please remember you can always find resources on the R3 webpage that might help you, or you can email the statewide R3 program. We're going to put both of those um, contacts in the chat for you and even the email. So that's just ready to go for you if you have any more questions. Please join us for our next R3 H3 sessions, which include an exciting discussion on an intro to cold freshwater fishing, a beginner's guide to trout fishing. And in June, we have a beginner's look at archery. So um, you can find registration links to those by visiting our R3 calendar or by watching our social media, or you can sign up to receive monthly updates from CDFW through our online licensing portal. Additionally, we'd like you to visit the event or um, you know, thank all of you and you can visit the event registration page and see even more things that we offer as resources, especially in our advanced hunting um, education clinics offered through the Hunter Education Program. So check those out. Thank you again for coming today. You know, it means a lot to us to spend your lunch hour with us on a Friday. So thank you for doing your part to continue learning to be uh, better hunters, anglers, and foragers. Uh, this session will be up on our website in uh, the next coming week. So be able to look for that and we will see you in two weeks for our next session. Thank you.